Do you know what to do if you're being followed? Take our quiz on safety tips to see how well you're prepared. You're taking the quiet, empty street home after a long day at work. Suddenly, you hear footsteps behind you. You turn into another street, but the footsteps are still following you. What should you do? No worries, I got you. First off, you gotta make sure the person is really following you and not just going home in the same direction. How are you gonna do it? There can be more than one correct answer here. A. Try walking a bit faster to check if they're trying to catch up with you. B. Casually stop, pretending you're looking for something in your pocket or have a shoelace to tie. C. Stop abruptly and ask the person, why are you following me? D. Try to make a couple of turns to get to your starting position. If the person circles the area with you, they must be after you. Options A, B, and D are correct. And, of course, you shouldn't confront whoever is following you. So, it's obvious that the stranger is following you. Don't panic. You'll need a sharp mind to lose them. And this group of people over there might help you. What should you do now? A. Yell help as loud as you can and run to them. B. Approach them and ask them to walk you home. C. Pretend that you know them. Say hey as they're walking past you and explain the situation and ask them to walk you to a public area from where you can get a taxi or go home to ask your friends to pick you up. D. All of the above options are okay. The only correct answer here is C. It's too dangerous to scream in an empty street before you reach the people or show the stalker where you live. They might come back the next day. Now, imagine the street is absolutely empty and you have no one to ask for help. It means you gotta move to a busy street as soon as possible. What should you not do on your way there? There are two correct answers here. A. If you're wearing a hoodie, tuck the hood into your sweater to hide it. B. Let your hair down if you wear it in a ponytail or bun. C. Take your phone and pretend you're texting someone or browsing the internet. D. Pat your pockets, pretending you've lost your wallet. E. Start walking fast in the direction of your stalker. The two correct answers here are C and E. You shouldn't take your phone out because the light on the screen will make it harder for your eyes to adjust to the dark. Looking through your phone will also slow you down. You should walk in the opposite direction of your stalker, of course. As for A and B, it'll be harder for your followers to grab your entire set of hair or pull your clothes if they have nothing to hold on to. While walking in the direction of a busy street, pay attention to every detail around you. Notice the street name and house numbers and remember the stores and buildings around you. You might need this later, but what should you do about the person following you? A. Don't look at them at all. It's dangerous. B. Avoid eye contact by all means. C. Try to seem as small as you can and keep your chin down to show how scared you are. D. Turn around and look at your follower and remember every detail about them their clothes, eye color, height, and approximate age. The correct answer here is D. Of course, you need to study the follower in detail to be able to give an accurate description of them later. Establishing eye contact will send them the I see you message. Your confidence will make them really uncomfortable and probably even make them reconsider their plans. Going after someone who has their head up takes a lot of courage, and pursuers aren't usually that brave. Okay, not to freak you out or anything, but what if that creepy person approaches you and asks for something? What should you do in this case? There will be more than one correct answer here. A. Keep consistent eye contact. B. Engage in a conversation with them. If they ask you how to get somewhere, explain it in every detail. C. If you're carrying books or shopping bags, be ready to drop them as soon as you feel something's off. D. Don't stay quiet. Make a fuss as you try to leave and yell fire instead of help. Okay, 
Here, all the answers except for B are correct. You should just briefly say, I don't know, to whatever question they ask you. And about that fire thing, people react to that word more often than a call for general help. For extra safety, get your keys out and place them in your palm with the key's teeth sticking out through your fist. If worse comes to worst, you'll have something pointy to defend yourself with so you can get away. When you manage to escape from your stalker, get your phone out and call the police. Now you'll need all those details about your whereabouts and the person following you. What if you notice someone following you in public? They stop at every store you go to, pretend to check the phone every time you do the same, and follow you step by step. What should you do then? There will be more than one correct answer here. A. If your jacket is of a different color from your shirt, take your coat off. The follower might lose you in the crowd. B. Walk into a restaurant or coffee shop, head straight to the bathroom and stay there for 5 to 10 minutes. Your follower might just leave. C. Start screaming to draw everyone's attention. Let them all panic. D. Get in the line, order something, and casually let one of the staff members know someone is following you. Panic has never helped anyone, so C is the only wrong answer here. You should just inform the staff there's a problem and let them keep an eye out for you. Then, you sit down with your order and message your friends or family that you need them to come and take you home or keep you company. Let's imagine a different scenario. Someone might be following you by car. You slow down, and they slow down. You turn right, and they follow you. You speed up, and they do the same. But still, you gotta be sure they're after you. How will you do it? A. Stop abruptly while passing by the traffic lights. B. Roll down your window and scream, help. C. Drive home immediately. If the car follows you, it's clearly not a coincidence. D. Make three right turns around the block. The correct answer here is D. A won't work out because you don't want to get into an accident, do you? B is just a bit silly. And C is a big no-no. You should never let the pursuer know where you live. Even if you get inside safely today, they might wait for you there the following day. D makes sense because no one will aimlessly go in circles around the neighborhood for no reason. Okay, so unfortunately, you're now 100% sure you've got unwanted company. What will you do next? There will be two correct answers here. A. Don't let them get you cornered. B. Drive to the busy roads. C. Try to establish contact with the pursuer. D. Stop moving and get out of the car. A and B are what you should do. You always need to have some room for maneuvers, and it's easier to escape on a busy road. Don't let the pursuer know you're aware of them. They might distance themselves from you, and it will be more difficult for you to remember the important details about them. <laughs> Don't get out of your vehicle, lock all the doors, and roll up the windows. If they're still following you, call the police using hands-free tech, drive into a car wash, and call from there, or drive directly to the nearest police station. So, if you answered at least five of the questions correctly, you're all good. You won't panic, as you know exactly what to do when someone is following you. If you had difficulty answering the questions, you might want to revise the safety tips from our videos. Endless hot deserts seem lifeless at first glance. But among these sands, you can meet dangerous and sometimes creepy creatures. Some of them can only cause health problems, but some can stay in your memory forever. Let's get to know them, starting with dangerous ones and finishing with real nightmares. So, you're walking through a desert and see a big teddy bear with open hands. You understand that it's probably a mirage, but still, you come closer. You were right. It's not a plush toy, but a giant cactus. There's something strange about it. Thanks to some strange fluff, the branches resemble the arms of a teddy bear. However, this is not fluff, but thousands of thin needles, and they are the reason you shouldn't come closer. 
The cactus is called the jumping cholla, or teddy bear cholla. It grows in the desert areas of Arizona and in the northern part of Mexico. Don't worry, this cactus won't attack you, but it will cling to your skin or clothes if you touch it. Such a fur coat protects the cactus from animals, creates shade, and saves it from heat. The lateral branches are the most important parts of the plant as they carry out photosynthesis and accumulate a large amount of moisture inside. So, despite all the danger, the cactus can be helpful for desert wanderers. And the danger here is needles. If you look closer at them, you will see they have the shape of hooks. One touch, and hundreds of thorns are already in your finger. It's pretty difficult to get rid of them and the needles cause unpleasant, painful sensations. But the coolest thing about this cactus is the way it reproduces. The plant clones itself in a new place. When animals and people pass the jumping cholla and touch it, the cactus gives them a small piece of itself along with the needles. As soon as you throw this piece to the ground, it takes root and starts growing. The degree of danger is rising. The next monster from the desert is running toward us, and that is an ostrich. Many think these animals are cowards hiding their heads in the sand. You will most likely change your mind if you're unlucky enough to meet one. Usually, ostriches are not aggressive, but you should run if you come closer to their nest. On the other hand, you won't be able to do that because ostriches move at a speed of 43 miles per hour. You need a car to get away from them. They run and hit their enemy with their chests. There have been cases when ostriches attacked vans and caused significant damage to them. But the main danger these birds present is their powerful legs with sharp claws. They can deliver strong blows with them and even beat a prone opponent. So yes, if you see an ostrich in the distance, go the other way. This small spotted lizard lives underground almost all the time in the arid deserts of the southwestern U.S. and northwestern Mexico. Sometimes, it goes outside to find lunch. It only seems cute, but in fact, it's a dangerous gila monster. Its thick skin protects the reptile from hawks, coyotes, and other predators. But its main protection is its venom. Snakes and spiders inject their toxins using long, needle-like fangs. The gila monster clamps down and chews the prey to spread the venom. And when it bites a person, it can keep its jaws closed for a long time. Getting rid of the animal is a tricky feat. People who have experienced the effects of the venom say it feels as if hot magma passes through the veins. Despite this, the lizard turned out to be useful for science. Doctors used its venom to create medicines for diabetes and obesity. The time has come. Now you're about to meet one of the creepiest creatures living in the desert. Be quiet and listen to the silence. Stand still. There's no one around. Suddenly, you hear some hissing coming from below. You lower your head and see it. A big yellow spider the size of a human palm with strong jaws and long legs hides in the shadow of your body. In horror, you run away from this monster, but it goes after you. It isn't easy to do it in this situation, but try to calm down. The creature isn't interested in you. It wants only your shadow to hide from the scorching sun. Anyway, it's better not to touch it. The powerful jaws of the camel spider can cause unpleasant sensations, to put it mildly. And, by the way, this creature isn't really a spider. Yeah, it belongs to the class of arachnids, but it's a separate species, Sulpigid. It likes to bite. It's fearless and pretty aggressive. The spider preys on insects, lizards, rodents, and small birds. It can also move at a speed of 10 miles per hour. For their small size, this is very fast. You need to be a professional athlete to run away from it. Most often, you can find camel spiders in the deserts of the Middle East, but they also live in Mexico and the southwestern U.S. These runners are nocturnal and try to avoid the sun during the day, so they are always hunting your shadow. By the way, they got their name because they often hide in the shadows of camels. 
You won't hide from them during the day, but they will also want to come after you at night, especially if you make a fire. Solpugids always run to the light in the hope of eating something. Some species of these spiders make a hissing sound to scare their enemies away. Now, let's calm down for a second and leave the hot desert. We're going into the humid tropics of Tanzania. Under tree bark, fallen leaves, and in dark caves, you can meet one of the most terrifying creatures on Earth, a tailless whip scorpion. Imagine a big scorpion without a tail with a flat body that looks like it has been pressed by something. It's similar to spiders, but has no venom glands and can't spin a web. This monster is silent and fast, but the scariest thing is its two front claws, twice as long as the creature itself. Any prey it catches will never escape. Life in a dark cave has spoiled its eyesight, so the whip scorpion tries to avoid sunlight. During molting, it climbs up to the ceiling and slowly comes out of its old skin. Imagine directing your flashlight there and seeing small cocoons out of which pale spiders with excessively long legs crawl. If you really meet it, be calm and slowly go away as far as possible. Be careful. The flat scorpion can crawl under your clothes in a second and bite you in the stomach. And that's not the worst part. Okay, this is a joke. This pretty guy is one of the shyest and most harmless creatures among spiders and scorpions. It's afraid of you and will never attack. Many consider it beautiful and keep whip scorpions in glass terrariums. If you want such a pet, carefully watch it so that it doesn't run away from its house. If it happens, it will be pretty challenging to catch it again. In a matter of moments, it can get under your bed or go through gaps in the floor. Then it'll go to your neighbor's apartment through a ventilation system and scare people there. Okay, how about one more scorpion? It's not as creepy as the other creatures in this video, but it's the most venomous scorpion in the USA. This is the Arizona bark scorpion. The problem is that you can see it in the desert, in your home, or in the yard. These dangerous venomous beasts crawl into rooms and often sting people. One time is enough to cause pain, similar to a bee sting. But someone with an allergy may experience paralysis, breathing problems, and other health issues. Well, it's that time of year again, spring cleaning. Making your way outside, you grab the duster and broom to get rid of all those cobwebs on your windows. They don't stand a chance this time. Removing one cobweb after the other, you suddenly notice some weird-shaped mud stuck under the eaves and porch. What's this? It suddenly dawns on you. These have to be mud dauber wasp nests. You're probably thinking there's a swarm of them around with so many nests being side by side. Luckily, mud dauber wasps are solitary insects. Whew! All those little mud huts are filled with paralyzed spiders. Sometimes, even up to 500 spiders can be trapped in these lockers, just waiting for the wasp young to hatch. If the nest has holes, it may indicate the nest is inactive or old, as mud dauber wasps create holes when they leave the nest. If you're not going to remove them, it's best to wait till nighttime when they're not as active. While they're pretty placid, if they feel threatened, they won't hesitate to sting. Looking like someone got halfway through building one insect and forgot what part came next, the mole cricket is one insect that really looks out of this world. With claws like a mole, a body of a cricket, and the head of a shrimp, this critter is like the platypus of the insect world. They're not venomous and will only bite if you trap them inside your hand. And if you really annoy it, it's got something else up its sleeve. The wings. They can spit a foul-smelling brown liquid from their body, just like a skunk. So just let them leave your home and there will be nothing to clean up. Rock pools are teeming with all sorts of plant and animal life. Sea creatures such as starfish, seagrass, hermit crabs, tiny fish, and all types of octopuses. If you come across this tiny blue-ringed octopus, it's best to leave it alone. It's flashing neon blue at you for a reason. This miniature octopus has a venomous bite that's a thousand times stronger than cyanide, 
with no antidote available. Don't poke it with a stick or try to pick one up. It's not worth the trip to the hospital or the morgue. Snakes on land are scary, but sea snakes are on an entirely different level. Found in the Indian and Pacific Oceans, there are about 50 different species of sea snakes, and they're beautiful as much as they're dangerous. Luckily, they don't seem to worry about us too much. The Dubois sea snake is arguably the most venomous snake in the ocean, with the big sea snake not far behind. Their venom makes a cobra's bite seem like a walk in the park. The venom of both these snakes is extremely dangerous. Good thing for us that their venom can take hours to cause any symptoms in humans. If they can bite through your wetsuit, that is. Now, if this fly lands on your arm outside, you might just scream a little. Hey, I wouldn't blame you. The scorpion fly, as its name suggests, has a curved tail that looks just like a scorpion stinger. But you can breathe a sigh of relief. This is only used for mating. It also has a long beak-like head that's used to feed after stealing insects from spiders' webs. To find the perfect partner, they love to give the equivalent of a box of chocolates and flowers. Except theirs is saliva. Hmm, how romantic. If you happen to be in Africa, you might just miss this large bird if you're not paying attention. The shoebill will just casually stand still as you walk right on by. Growing up to 5 feet tall with an 8-foot wingspan, the shoebill sounds like an apex predator, though it's anything but. Known as one of the most slow-moving birds, almost statue-like, the shoebill just eats fish near the surface of the water, without a care in the world. This bird isn't afraid of humans at all. While they won't naturally come over to talk about the weather, they'll allow us to get close enough for some photos. Now, if you hear a small squeaking sound while you're in the garden, it could be a mouse, a squirrel, or a rhinoceros beetle is letting you know that you are too close. They love to make a racket when bothered. With a giant scary horn on top of their head, they might seem like they're able to defend themselves with it. But that's not possible at all. That's only to move leaves and sticks out of their way and to stop other males from coming into the female beetle's area. Not only have they got a horn on their head, but they've also got Herculean strength, able to lift 850 times their own weight. It's like you or me lifting 65 tons or 11 elephants. Hey, let's try it. Nah. Found mainly in China, the small tufted deer looks adorable with its tuft of hair. That is, until it turns around. Oh no, it's a vampire deer! Luckily, this animal doesn't want to taste your blood or wear a cape. Only males grow these during the mating season, rather than antlers, to fight over territories and female tufted deer. These fangs are more like elephant tusks than sharp teeth. Not only do they have fangs, but they're also known to bark like a dog and flee like a cat when they're scared. Red sky at night, sailor's delight. Red sky in the morning, sailor's warning. No one said anything about a red tide, though. The red tide is a toxic algal bloom that rises up from the seafloor after particularly bad storms. This algae looks a lot like spilled ketchup or rust in the water, but it's much worse for the life around it. Fish and marine life will try to escape once exposed to the toxic algae in their water. It's not particularly harmful to humans who are exposed to it. But if you eat seafood contaminated with its toxins, things can become a bit more serious. So if the sea is red, just stay out of the water. Some spiders love to show off with bright colors to show they're dangerous. Not the Sydney funnel web spider of Australia. This glossy black spider doesn't need theatrics to prove it's tough. These bad-tempered crawlers cause serious alarm when they decide to bite us. It can shut down our entire nervous system in as little as 30 minutes. Making their web in any shelter, like old logs, shoes, or even garden gnomes, the funnel web spiders like to live close to our surroundings for easy food. When they get tired of an area, 
they just leave their web behind and wander off to find somewhere new. <laughs> Perfect. Some say honey badgers don't care, and I think they might be right. When you're brave enough to take food away from a jaguar, lion, or hyena, hey, what do you got to fear? These tough relatives of the weasel aren't just ferocious, they're super smart. Known to even use tools to escape from enclosures. Objects like rakes, stones, and mud just become things to climb for freedom. Aside from their physical similarities to the skunk, the honey badger also boasts a dangerous gland in its tail containing a powerful stink machine. So they're tough, stinky, have extremely stretchy and strong skin, and to top it all off, they've got a strong immunity to scorpions and snakes. The best thing to do if you walk into a honey badger is to leave it alone. What chance do we have? Ever heard of the fungus strawberries and cream? No? What about its other name, the bleeding tooth fungus? This fungus isn't toxic, but tastes so bitter that you might think twice about trying some. When young and growing, this white mushroom appears to have red jelly coming out of its pores. This sticky liquid is sap that's pushed up from taking on too much water. The adult mushroom is just a boring beige compared to this. Underneath the mushroom cap, where its spores are produced, it has a tooth-like structure, just to make it even weirder. Tasmanian devils have a reputation for being bad-tempered when threatened by a predator, fighting other males, or getting a place at the table for dinner. They're dubbed devils because of the teeth-bearing, lunging, and one of the scariest shrieks you'll ever hear in the middle of the night. They'll also eat pretty much anything they can get a hold of, too. They don't habitually go for people, although they will defend themselves if they're cornered. With such a powerful bite, you wouldn't want to be on the receiving end. Good thing the tassie devils would much rather escape as well. You're hiking the Point Reyes National Seashore, and you bump into a mountain lion. Stay calm. You need to show it that you're not scared. Shout loudly at the lion. Wave your arms. If that doesn't work, start throwing rocks, branches, or anything else you can get your hands on. Aim at the ground in front of the lion. Never throw anything directly at it. That will only make it angrier. If the lion is getting closer, protect your most vulnerable spots. It will aim for the neck and try to grab your arms. So tilt your head forward and protect your neck and don't make sweeping arm movements. When the lion realizes that you're not an easy opponent, it will probably back off and run away. You're in Yellowstone. Here you have to come face to face with the grizzly bear. It's drinking water from a creek. A safe distance is 200 feet. The grizzly has spotted you. It stands on its hind legs and looks in your direction. Now it's about the height of an average basketball player and it weighs almost 800 pounds, so you don't stand a chance to win. You have to freeze in place. Grizzlies have poor eyesight, so it just might not see you. But then it starts walking in your direction. Don't turn your back to it and don't even try to run as fast as you can. It will chase you. You need to seem bigger than you really are. Wave your arms and spread your legs a little wider. Always talk and shout at the bear. It will understand that you're not a humble deer. Try to make a clanking sound of metal. If you have food with you, don't throw it at the bear. Just put it on the ground and keep backing away while facing the bear. If it starts running towards you, your only chance is to fall to the ground and freeze. Bears aren't scavengers, so if it thinks you're not alive, it'll just sniff you, shrug, and walk away. Now you go diving on the Florida coast. You have to protect yourself from the great white shark. Never wear shiny and blinging jewelry when swimming. It attracts sharks. And never swim at night. This is when they go out looking for food. Lots of splashing water can also attract this marine predator. But if the shark swims towards you anyway, the rule here is 1. Do everything in your power to defeat it. Try to stay calm and swim to the shore. If the shark chooses you as food, there's only one thing that can scare it off. Try to punch the shark in the nose, eyes, or gills. Now you're in Africa. Here in the tall grass of the savanna, you see a lion, and worse, it sees you. The first thing you need to do is maintain eye contact. Don't turn your back to the lion and don't run. This 8-foot predator, weighing like three adults, is running at you at the speed of a car on the highway. But then it stops abruptly and continues to stare at you. Lions often make fake charges to frighten their opponent. At this point, you have to appear much bigger than you really are. Spread your arms and make loud noises. Then the lion can make another fake charge. And if you keep standing still, the lion will realize you're a strong opponent and go the other way. 
The female lion is way more dangerous than the male one. If it's guarding the babies, it won't stop and you won't stand a chance. Your safari jeep takes you to the next location. You see elephants peacefully drinking water. These guys can be 10 feet tall and weigh as much as two SUVs. They can even flip cars over with their powerful tusks. And now, one of them sees you and wags its big ears. It's bluffing. With those ears, the elephant wants to appear bigger and scare you away. It's also scared and won't run at you all the way. You must let the elephant know you're not threatening it. Don't yell or wave your arms. Take slow steps back until you leave the elephant's personal space. If it runs at you with ears to its head, it's not bluffing. Climbing a tree isn't a good option right now. It might ram the tree and you'll fall down. It might even tilt the tree with its strong trunk. You need to run in a zigzag pattern. The elephant is heavy and it's hard for it to change directions quickly. So gradually, you'll start to pull away from it. But still remember that an elephant can run 25 miles per hour, so you'll unlikely escape from it. Now let's move on to the Nile River. It has the largest number of crocodiles in the world. If you are camping, take a distance of at least 160 feet from the shore. This way, the crocodile will not stumble upon your camp at night. Never take your eyes off the crocodile. It can take advantage of that moment and take you by surprise. Their top speed is only 10 miles per hour, but they can make charges at 40 feet per second from the water. So the only chance to survive is to stay out of the water. If not, the crocodile's weak points are the eyes, the tip of the nose, and the membrane in the throat. This membrane prevents water from entering the crocodile's throat. When running away from a crocodile, be careful not to bump into a hippopotamus. This is one of the most dangerous animals in the world. They can be the size of a business class car and weigh as much as a big elephant. And they can run as fast as horses, so they're sure to outrun you in a sprint. The main thing is to not frighten it. If you're standing far away, get its attention with a loud sound. Usually they will try to get away from you. Use this moment to back away too. But if you see a hippo yawning, it's a sign that you're violating its comfort zone. They can open their mouth at 180 degrees and have the bite force of a crocodile. So you can't beat it and have to run. The best option is to climb a tree or some kind of slope. Hippos have a hard time climbing high places. And if you manage to escape, you'd be one of the few people who survived a face-to-face -face encounter with a hippo. There's also buffaloes living here in the savannah. They can be as tall as an adult and weigh a whole ton. And unlike lions and elephants, they don't make a fake charge. If you see this machine running at you, it definitely has evil intentions. Their powerful horns and skull can bend sheets of metal. They can turn a new car into a pile of scrap metal. You can never outrun a buffalo, so your only option is to find the nearest tree and run to it before the buffalo even starts its charge. If you run into a snake, you need to freeze in place. There are endless species of snake, and you don't know if your opponent is venomous or not. So you definitely need to avoid getting bitten. Make smooth and slow backward movements. If the snake is following you, stop and start stomping your feet. The strong vibrations of the ground should scare it away. If the snake bit you anyway, try to remember exactly what it looked like. Better yet, take a picture of it. To neutralize the venom, you need to take an antidote to the specific venom of that species of snake. You're on your way to Northeast Asia. As you're going through the dense jungle, you see a clearing. Several wild boars are peacefully grazing there. One of them is a female with several children. It'll do anything to protect them, so it's especially aggressive now. Oops, it spotted you. Get ready to defend yourself. If the wild boar is making high-pitched, piercing cries, it's going to strike you. The first thing you need to do is to stay calm and stand still. You have a good chance that the boar will go on its way, but you see it starting to run. And now you have several options. A, you can run away. B, you can face the blow. And C, climb the nearest tree. The first option is wrong. Wild boars can run almost as fast as Usain Bolt, and when it catches up to you, its sharp tusks won't leave you a chance. Option B, stay where you are. Wrong. A wild boar can weigh as much as a motorcycle and be almost as long as an adult. A hit at 25 miles per hour will just knock you down. So the correct option is to climb the nearest tree. If there's no trees, then climb a car or a tall rock. You have to be in a higher position than the boar. When it realizes it can't reach you, it'll leave you alone. The most important thing is to stay away from wild boars. Never try to feed them or provoke them. Well, it's a nice Sunday afternoon and you're shopping at your regular grocery store when you stumble upon a bloated package in the fresh produce aisle. You check the product information. It seems well within its expiration date. Then why the unusual shape, you may wonder? The answer is not always straightforward. 
For some types of fresh products, such as meat, fish, or seafood, sometimes even salads and cheese, scientists came up with something called MAP, or Modified Atmosphere Packaging, to ensure that these types of products with a relatively short shelf life stay fresh for as long as possible. A combination of gases is introduced in the packaging. It happens even before the product reaches your local grocery store. A French professor at the Montpelier School of Pharmacy stumbled upon this method after he noticed that fruits tend to stay fresh for longer periods of time in low oxygen storage conditions. The types of gases in MAP packaging can vary from product to product, but the main idea is to replace or reduce the content of oxygen. It's generally replaced with either nitrogen or carbon dioxide. Keep in mind that just because a bloated bag of salad is within its expiration date, it doesn't mean it's always safe to eat. The gases inside the bag may very well be there for their own purpose, but they can also be a sign that the product is spoiled. That's why the best course of action when shopping would be to check if the product is not expired. If it's still within the day, Mm -hmm. check for any unusual odors or damage to Mm. the packaging. If something seems off, it's best not to risk it. You can reach out to any of the store staff if you have any questions or concerns. Most supermarkets these days have a layout which allows for a logical shopping order, like buying non-perishable items first, then adding refrigerated or frozen products. Fruits and vegetables should come last since you won't want them at the bottom of your shopping cart. Nobody likes a squished tomato. While I'm on the subject of fruits and veggies, try to get them earlier in the morning if possible. Veggies that have been sitting out all day may lose some of their shape and texture, while others may be a bit wilted away. Quick tip on waste management, never buy more produce than you intend to use in a week. Most fruits and vegetables don't even last that long, so it's best not to give in to cravings. Shopping on a full stomach might help with that as well just as much as going shopping with a pre-made list of things you need to buy. Thoroughly inspecting the package of every product might save you some hustle later as well. Refrigerated products need to feel cold to the touch, whilst frozen ones need to be solid and with no sign of leakage. When you get home, make sure you refrigerate all the necessary items as soon as possible. Generally, they shouldn't be out of the refrigerator for more than two hours. Otherwise, their quality won't stay the same. Buying potted herbs from the grocery store may not be the first thing on your list, but it's surely something to consider. Not only are they available for a fraction of the cost, but they're also easy to grow and take care of. Just picture a nice herb garden right there on your balcony or even in the kitchen. Wouldn't that be nice? You'll always have fresh basil to top a mouth-watering pasta dish. Since you're still at the grocery store, pick up some coffee filters while you're at it. You may not have a machine at home that actually uses filters, but there are a lot more things you can use them for around the house. They can be used for straining liquids, safely stacking delicate china in your cupboards, or even polishing windows, or shoes for that matter. If your favorite fruits and vegetables are on sale, but buying large quantities would mean they go to waste, consider freezing them. You can stock up on items for smoothies, especially for the colder season when there are limited options for fresh fruits. And don't just grab the first thing on the shelf, especially if it's likely to go bad quickly. Stores restock their produce following a first-in, first-out layout. So the items at the back of the shelf will always be a tad bit fresher. The same goes for tea if you prefer it to coffee. Switch to buying loose-leaf tea, and you'll not only reduce the cost, you'll also be able to make your own homemade tea blends. Loose-leaf tea also has a stronger flavor than tea sold in tea bags. As for the other household stuff, stock up on items such as light bulbs, paper towels, or batteries. Chances are you'll always be needing at least one of these items, so it's best to buy them in larger quantities when on sale. They never go to waste, and let's face it, it's always annoying when you run out of batteries at home and your TV remote stops working. Hey, tell me about it. Try to reduce the number of times you go to the grocery store to buy just one item. It's inefficient, and most likely, you'll end up buying things that you don't actually need. Uh, That shopping list starts to make a lot more sense now, doesn't it? Another list worth making, the one containing whatever you have in the fridge. Try to create such a list at least twice a week. Meal planning for at least a week in advance will also help you reduce impulse buying. 
If you already know what you'll want for dinner on Wednesday, why add anything else to the card if it's unnecessary? At the same time, start getting creative with your leftovers. There's no need for them to go to waste when you can mix and match or add some additional herbs and flavors to spice them up. Store leftovers in transparent containers for added visibility. And don't be afraid to set out a leftover day during the week. It's also nice to look at them as ingredients rather than leftovers. Use extra leftover pasta or steamed vegetables for a frittata or an (laughs) omelette. Blend together cooked vegetables with some tomatoes to create a pasta sauce. Put together some wraps for the next day's lunch with anything from leftover cooked rice to meat and vegetables. Or, if you're really looking for the easiest method to save leftovers, you can always turn them into soup. Last night's vegetable side dish can turn into a wholesome lunch if you simply add a can of broth and blend it all together. Even a two-day-old loaf of bread can be salvaged if you cut it diagonally, sprinkle the slices with some herbs and olive oil, and pop them in the oven for a couple of minutes. You'll then have yourself some nice homemade croutons for that previously mentioned soup. A little label know-how never hurt anyone either. Be on the lookout for ingredients you've never heard of or those you can't pronounce. An item that usually has more than five ingredients listed on the packaging should be avoided. Even the way you carry your groceries in the supermarket can affect how and what you buy. If you prefer baskets to shopping carts, you're more prone to impulse searches. That's what a study published by the Journal of Marketing Research claims. It happens due to the effort you put in actually carrying the items around. Choosing a shopping cart will most likely make you comfortable enough to browse through enough products and read labels thoroughly. When your grocery list is not too big, go for the self-checkout aisle if available. Studies have shown that impulse purchases are lowered by up to 32% if you actually scan your own items on the way out. That's because the regular checkout line is specially designed to keep you from letting go of any items you might have reconsidered buying. There's literally nowhere you can put down your undesired products, outside of your grocery cart. And if there's anyone else waiting in line behind you, good luck sliding out. The food arrangement on the shelves can also pose a threat to both your budget and your habits. Since people are more inclined to buy the items they see first, The most expensive products are placed at eye level, and the budget options are placed on the top and bottom shelf. Take your time and scan your aisles of interest. You'll be surprised to see that most items placed on higher or lower shelves are often not only more cost-effective, but also less packed with additives or artificial flavor. Hey, be careful. It's a jungle in there. Well, it's time to stretch your legs and take a walk in the park. The sun is shining, and you enjoy the weather and life on the whole. That's when you spot a rapidly growing vertical cloud. Bright white at first, it's approaching alarmingly fast, becoming dense and inky. The sky is darkening, and a gust of wind blows the hat off your head. And then, your hair starts to stand on end. That's your cue to run for your life. You're about to be hit by lightning. At this very moment, positive charges are rising through your body. They're reaching toward the negatively charged part of the storm. If you don't react fast, these charges will meet, and it'll end badly for you. If there's nowhere you can hide, crouch down and try to make yourself smaller than the objects around you. Don't lie flat on the ground. It may be wet and thus a great conductor of electricity. There are also other signs that scream danger during a lightning storm. Your palms may begin to sweat. You might hear bizarre crackling, buzzing, or vibrating sounds coming from metal objects nearby. Your skin can start to tingle. There might be a strange metallic taste in your mouth. If you're sure you're not chewing on tinfoil, then look out. Plus, you're likely to smell chlorine. That's ozone. Electrical charges split the molecules of nitrogen and oxygen which are the main gases forming the atmosphere, into separate atoms. When these atoms come together again, some of them produce molecules made up of three oxygen atoms. That's ozone. You can smell it during a thunderstorm because downdrafts bring it from high altitudes to your nose level. You can figure out how close a thunderstorm is by measuring the time between spotting the lightning and hearing the thunder. Every five seconds is one mile. The sky over your head is darkening and turning ominously green. 
something hits you on the cheek. Ouch, it hurts. You pick up the offending object. It's a massive hailstone. But it's not that cold outside, and it's not raining. You notice how still everything is, how quiet. There's no wind whatsoever. It makes you think about the calm before the storm. And indeed, soon you hear some noise. It's approaching rapidly and turns into a loud roar, as if a freight train is moving towards you. Only, it's not a train. It's a tornado, and you have almost no time to escape. The funnel isn't visible behind a cloud of debris. But you can't mistake this rotating column of air for anything else. If the tornado catches you on the road, get as far from your car as you can. This will prevent the vehicle from being hurtled toward you. Find a ditch, lie down in it, and cover your head. If you're inside, get away from windows and hide underground if possible. Now, you're at the seaside, walking along the shore and enjoying a light breeze. Suddenly, the ground starts shaking under your feet. Must be an earthquake! The next weirdness you notice is the water retreating from the beach at breakneck speed. It leaves behind the exposed ocean floor, reefs, and even fish. That's when you hear a distant roaring sound. It's a tsunami, and you only have a few minutes to save your life. Get to high ground immediately. A giant wave is already speeding toward the shore. It's not the only way a tsunami can creep up on you. It doesn't necessarily come crashing against the shore as a series of huge waves. A tsunami can look like a rapidly rising tide. It usually goes hand-in-hand with severe underwater turbulence. It pulls people under the surface and tosses heavy objects around. You can also notice seawater bubbling, swirling, and creating bizarre patterns. It's another sure sign a tsunami's coming. Your dog's restless. It's scratching the entrance door, roaming around the apartment, and trying to hide in the corner. Usually calm and docile, the pooch is now howling and barking. The weather's also been crazy for the past several days. It's hot one day and chilly 24 hours later. Plus, you've noticed that the stream near your house has livened up, bubbling as it's rushing past. Only when glasses start to clink in your cupboard do you realize what it means. The clatter is produced by four shocks, tiny earthquakes leading up to the main event. Earthquakes often occur in clusters. If there are several weak quakes, a much bigger one might be on the way. Sometime before the disaster strikes, you might notice bizarre blue lights. Some of them seem to be coming from the ground, others are hovering in the air. These are so-called earthquake lights. Emitted from rocks under great stress, they can be seen days or mere seconds before the ground starts shaking. At the same time, some experts doubt earthquake lights exist. If you think an earthquake is about to happen and there's a catfish in your aquarium, pay attention to its behavior. Scientists have proved this species can react to earth tremors. The fish become restless when seismic activity is high. Some bugs can feel a storm coming. They get ready for the natural disaster by stopping any movement. That's why, if you notice that lots of insects around you look drowsy, search for shelter. As for bees, they can predict heavy rainstorms. They begin to work much harder the day before it starts raining. Square waves occur when two wave patterns crash into each other. This phenomenon looks awesome, but only if you're watching it from the shore. Don't even think of getting in the water to play in such waves. In that place, there are cross currents that can easily pull even a skilled swimmer under the surface. And if you see wild choppy waves carrying ocean debris and seaweed, stay out of the water too. It can be a sign of a strong rip current. It can carry you far away from the ocean. If you see smelly green stuff on the surface of a lake or sea, stay away from the water. It can be a hazardous algal bloom. You won't be able to tell whether it's toxic or not at first sight. That's why it's better to steer clear of it altogether. Three or four days before a hurricane arrives, the sea or ocean surface can swell up to 6 feet. Waves hit the shore every 9 seconds. The closer the hurricane, the more rapidly the waves crash against the shore. They also get higher, sometimes up to 16 feet. The sky is littered with light, fluffy clouds. Roughly 36 hours before the hurricane reaches the shore, the atmospheric pressure begins to drop. After that, the wind speeds up. Wispy, hair-like clouds appear in the sky. 
18 hours before the hurricane makes it to the shore, the sky opens up and it starts to pour. The rainwater often floods low-lying areas, welling up to 15 feet. When the hurricane is 12 hours away, a powerful gale starts to bring along loose debris. Six hours before the landfall, the wind speed is already 90 miles per hour. It's strong enough to break and even uproot trees, fling around large debris, and flip cars. By the way, let's say you're sailing and there are some sharks circling your boat. Keep an eye on them. If the predators suddenly leave you alone and head for deep water, it might mean a hurricane is drawing closer. Get back to dry land as fast as you can and warn others. If during a period of heavy rains, you hear a roaring sound, it might be a flash flood moving in your direction. If you're near a river at that moment, you might see debris coming down with the flow. The water can be changing its color and becoming cloudier and darker. These signs should set alarm bells ringing in your head. If your gut feeling is right, you have no time to waste. Try to get away from that place as fast as you can. Flash floods are often lethal. If you're out in the wild, pay attention to the water in creeks, streams, and rivers. If it's falling or rising rapidly, it might be a sign a landslide is about to happen. And if you see the water turn muddy, don't wait for more evidence. Get out of the area immediately. Earthquake lights are some of the most mysterious natural phenomena. They can show up before, during, or after an earthquake. They're usually white or blue and last for a short time, but sometimes they can last up to 10 minutes. It's hard to study them because they can happen at different distances from an earthquake center. We know that they only happen during powerful earthquakes that have a Richter scale rating of 5 or higher. Scientists believe they may be caused by the release of ionized oxygen that occurs when certain rocks break apart. This next weird phenomenon is not spontaneous, but it doesn't make it any less impressive. You'll need to head over to La Macarena, Colombia to see it. It's called the Liquid Rainbow or the River of Five Colors. Here you can see the river change colors from red, yellow, green, and purple depending on the light and water conditions. This amazing sight is caused by a very talented aquatic plant. It attaches itself to the rocks in the river and gives the water a reddish color. The water is also very clear, with very few particles floating in it, making the red pigments show even clearer. Should you ever reach this amazing destination, you'll also meet diverse fauna hanging around the lake. Red macaws can be seen at this location as well as howler monkeys. Every fall and spring, a magnificent natural phenomenon takes place in the Wadden Sea region in northern Europe. Approximately 1.5 million starlings flock at the same spot to rest in the tall grass for the night. However, before the night settles in, the starlings may be surrounded by hungry birds of prey. This creates a mesmerizing dance as the starlings form intricate patterns to escape from the birds of prey. This spectacle is referred to as the Black Sun and involves thousands of millions of birds flying in formation. The reason for their synchronized flight is that it makes it more challenging for predators to single out and capture some of the starlings. Volcanic sounds, also called volcanic acoustics, can happen before an eruption. They come from magma getting pressurized in cracks and pipes bubbling explosions, and hot water systems near the surface of the volcano. As the magma rises, gas builds up and cracks the surface open. The gas-rich magma creates a sound like a pipe organ, which is known as a volcanic tremor. The sound changes over time, resembling a natural concert. A volcanic tremor is a sign that an eruption is coming. So it's best to seek shelter if you hear anything unusual near a volcanic site. One of the most surreal phenomena to experience on Earth is near sand dunes. Should you ever be at the top of a sand dune, you may be lucky enough to hear one of the strangest things, singing sand. The truth is scientists have yet to fully understand why this phenomenon occurs. 
One theory claims that the sand might produce this sound while sliding down the dunes because of the friction between its grains. But how can you recognize whether what you hear is singing sand? Well, it's similar to an airplane flying in the distance. One of the few places on Earth where sand makes such a loud noise that it can actually be heard by tourists is in the Namib Desert in Africa, or in the barking sands of Hawaii. To see a rare golden waterfall, you'll have to drive to Yosemite National Park, more precisely, to the Horsetail Falls. You will need to plan your trip ahead of time to make sure you get there either in the winter or early spring. It's the only period of the year when this beautiful sight can be spotted. Let's be clear, it's not real gold falling down the mountain. Actually, it's an optical illusion. When at dusk, the sunlight hits the waterfall in such a unique way that it makes it look like a river of lava or gold. In a California national park called Death Valley, there are some rocks that seem to move on their own and leave trails behind. Scientists thought the roadrunner bird could be responsible for these movements, but this creature is too small to drag rocks around. They also thought it could be the wind, but the rocks are also too heavy to be blown away. Scientists have been studying the rocks for years. But until 2014, they hadn't actually seen the rocks move. They'd just seen them in different positions at different times. With the help of time-lapse photography, they discovered that the movement was caused by a combination of rainfall, rapid temperature changes, and a bit of wind. When it rains, the water sometimes freezes and the rocks get stuck in the ice. As the temperature rises, the ice starts to melt and move slowly, dragging the rocks with it. The traces left behind solidify under the heat of the sun. The ice sheets that move the rocks is very thin and evaporates quickly which is why it was difficult for scientists to understand this phenomenon. Have you ever heard of a dirty thunderstorm? Buckle up, because I'm about to take you on a wild ride through the world of volcanic lightning. No, it's not a new dancing technique, although that would be pretty impressive. It's just a funky way of saying lightning and thunder during a volcanic eruption. When a regular thunderstorm happens, positive and negative particles collide and create a big spark of lightning. And the rumble you hear? That's just thunder. But when a volcano starts to holler, some ash particles get electrified and start colliding with each other. This causes electrical discharges, making it look like there's lightning coming straight from the volcano. And with all the ash, smoke, and gas flying around, it looks like something straight out of a sci-fi movie. That's why it's sometimes called a dirty thunderstorm, too. Whoa! Did you just see that giant ray of light shooting up into the sky? They're called light pillars. And don't worry, they're not a magic trick. Just a bunch of ice crystals playing tricks on us. You see, when it's cold outside, these ice crystals floating near the ground reflect light from unshielded lights and create these columns of light that look like they're coming from outer space. But really, it's just a bunch of little crystals showing off their reflective skills. And if you think those natural light pillars are cool, wait till you see the artificial ones. They can be even taller because the light from streetlights is not the same. Ice crystals can reflect the light even if they're a little tilted. Just imagine, all that light is coming from streetlights just a few feet away. So next time you see a light pillar, don't run for cover, just enjoy the show. If you come across these quirky, bubble-like shapes in the sky, consider yourself lucky. These little gems are called mammatus clouds, and they're not your everyday run-of-the-mill clouds. Most clouds are formed when air rises, making them look like big cotton balls. But mammatus clouds are formed when air sinks, making them look like they're upside down. The air above and below such clouds creates a little turbulence, and before you know it, cloud particles form perfectly round orbs. Just don't stand there gawking at them for too long. They often signal that a thunderstorm is on its way. What do we have here? It looks like the sun is wearing a colorful party hat made of rainbows on top of the Ore Mountains in Germany. This phenomenon is called a sun halo, by the way. These snow-covered trees look like they're joining in on the fun too. It's all thanks to those ice crystals in high clouds. 
They love to bend and reflect light, making it look like the sun is having a halo lava lamp dance party. And yes, it might mean that bad weather is just around the corner, but don't let it spoil your fun. You can still hang around and take some great pictures. You check into your hotel room, connect to Wi-Fi, jump on the bed, and post 15 photos of your new window view. When the initial surge of excitement is gone, you notice a suspicious blinking light on your big TV. Could it be that someone is watching you? Or have you just seen too many spy movies? Well, hidden cameras come in all shapes and sizes. Large ones are easy to spot, but the small ones can be really sneaky and inconspicuous. They can be hiding behind furniture, in decorations or vents, and anywhere else you'll have trouble noticing. There are even special cameras that can be hidden in everyday movable objects like alarm clocks, picture frames, vases, and lamps. Check to see if these objects are facing at a strange angle or if they're positioned to get the best view of your room or bathroom. The easiest way to spot a hidden cam is to look for the lens reflection because all cameras come with lenses. Turn off the lights and slowly scan the room with a flashlight, laser pointer, or a special wireless spy cam detector. It comes with infrared scanning lights and one illuminating light. When you find a reflective red spot, you gotta turn on the flashlight to help check if there is a hidden camera. Definitely check the vents along with any other holes and gaps in the walls or ceiling. Some advanced detectors even show you what the camera is seeing, making it way easier to spot and disable. The detectors only work on cameras that are turned on and working normally, though. Your mobile phone can also help you find some hidden threats. Turn on Bluetooth and walk around. See if any unknown devices pop up on the screen. Another idea is to install a network scanner app that shows all devices that are connected to the Wi-Fi network you're using at the hotel. When it's done scanning, study the list for devices called something like IP camera or cam. Plus, you can put your phone on selfie mode, turn off the light and close the curtains and look around the room slowly while focusing on the screen. Keep an eye out for purple or white lights on the screen. You can play detective some more and call your friend or family member and start walking around your room. Secret cameras should emit a sort of radio frequency. It will most likely interfere with your phone call signal. If you start hearing any weird noises while you're on the phone in a certain area of your room, make sure to inspect it carefully. Check out the light switches, electrical outlets, lamps, and other objects you normally wouldn't pay attention to. If they look a bit crooked, have a hole, or seem misplaced, it could be a sign that someone tampered with them. Many spy devices need wires, and whoever installed them had to hide those wires, often behind the vinyl baseboard. That's why the place where the floor and the wall meet is another area you should check. Ridges, bumps, or discoloration could be a sign there's a microphone hiding there. The same goes for spots on ceilings and walls even if they're not larger than a coin. If you do find a hidden camera or something looking suspicious, don't shy away and let the hotel administration or your booking service know about it. Don't try to touch or move the device yourself. If the hotel denies everything, contact local law enforcement. After you've scanned the room for cameras, check out the mirrors. Someone could be watching you from the other side. First, see if the mirror is built into the wall or can be adjusted. If the mirror is semi-transparent, it will be built into the wall. You can do a simple test to check the mirror. Press your fingertip against the glass and push firmly enough to leave a fingerprint as you move your finger away. Study the fingerprint. If there is a small gap between the print and the mirror where the glass should be, then it's just a mirror. On a semi-transparent mirror, there will be no gap. Another way to check if your mirror is semi-transparent is simply to tap the glass. If someone is watching you from the other side, the mirror will make an empty sound. A double mirror needs a brighter light on the other side than on yours. Get close to it and cup your hands around your eyes. Do you see some light behind the mirror? 
If so, you might have an unwanted audience. Before you leave your room or go to bed, make sure every door is securely locked. By every door, I mean not only the entrance to the room, but also the door leading to the terrace, if you have one. You can bring a portable door lock with you for extra security if you're staying in. You could also start a little DIY project and wrap a belt or a bag strap around the arm that pushes the door shut. Buckle it up and wrap it around several times for an extra layer of protection. Another idea for when you're about to nap or go to sleep is to build a pyramid of stuff by the door. Glasses and mugs will do perfectly. If someone tries to get inside while you're sleeping, there'll be some serious noise. Intruders prefer to keep it low-key, so they're highly likely to give up on robbing you straight away. If you travel with some valuables and don't feel comfortable leaving them around the room, you could put them in the safe inside your room. But because those safes use passcodes instead of physical locks, someone from the hotel has to know the master code to unlock it, just in case. So, you can bring your own safe with you instead. You can find the ones looking like books on Amazon, for example. They're made of strong metal and textured paper. They come with a combination lock and have enough room to fit your passports, cash, and jewelry. In case you have to leave your laptop in the room and want to make sure no one plugs in a USB drive to steal your data, here's what you can do. Leave a bottle of water or some other item next to the USB port. Measure the distance. Let's say it's one thumb length away. For someone to plug in their device in the laptop, they need to move the bottle. You can take it one step further and drop a pen parallel to the laptop under a certain angle. You can measure the angle with your smartwatch or phone using the Compass app. Again, if someone moves it, you'll know. Even something as simple as a please do not disturb sign can help you figure out if someone entered your room while you were away. Make it look like you left in a rush and the sign accidentally stuck between the door and the door frame. If you come back and the sign is hanging freely, then someone must have ignored it and tried to disturb you. In that case, you can contact reception and ask to send someone to enter the room with you to keep you safe. If you care about the cleanliness of your room as much as you do about your belongings and your personal safety, this one's for you. Hotel housekeeping workers normally have up to 20 rooms to take care of on an 8-hour shift. It means they'll have no more than 30 minutes for your room. It gives them enough time to make the bed, clean the floors in the room and the bathroom, empty the trash bins and dust all surfaces. But they rarely have the time to take care of smaller objects like light switches, door and drawer handles, and remotes. And yes, these are exactly the objects you'll be in contact with the most. They can actually have more germs than the toilet. So if you want to be sure those germs won't land on your hands, bring enough antibacterial wipes to clean all those things before you touch them. Did you know that every 15 seconds, a home burglary occurs in the United States? This means that approximately 4,800 burglaries happen every day. And the police can only solve 13% of all the reported cases. So yeah, home security is nothing to be joked about, and so I won't. But still, don't worry. It's not like you need to turn your house into a fortress to feel safe. There are a great number of things you can do to keep the bad people out of your house and keep your valuables safe without breaking the bank. First things first, homes without a security system are 300% more likely to be broken into and burglarized, so you should definitely consider setting up one. However, there are many different types of security systems out there. That's why it can get overwhelming to choose the best one for your specific needs, desired level of protection, and budget. Yet again, it all comes down to two options professional installations, and DIY installations. Let's go through both of them together. Professional installed systems require professional monitoring and usually have contracts that are likely long-term. Professional systems come with fees. However, companies usually require lower upfront equipment costs since they will spread the cost throughout the course of your contract. Once you decide on a professional installation, 
The company will first schedule an appointment with one of their experienced technicians who can conduct a security assessment and explain all your options to you. And as long as your contract is valid, you can report any problems you have with the system to them so they can make sure the equipment works correctly. All in all, you should pick professionally installed security systems if you want to put up your feet and relax instead of watching long hours of tutorial videos or reading pages of manuals. Still, professionally installed security systems may not work for you, especially if you're a renter due to the contract commitment conditions. Or maybe you're not a renter, but you simply have budget limitations. That's where DIY installations come in handy. The greatest thing about DIY systems is that while the average monitoring price is around $50 per month on professionally installed systems, it is around $28 a month on DIY ones. Plus, there are no installation fees with DIY systems either. Yet again, you should expect higher upfront equipment costs if you're going to pick this option. And there's also the fact that DIY home security systems come with the risks of improper equipment placement and missing security vulnerabilities a pro would catch. At the end of the day, the most important thing you need to do before choosing a system is evaluate the needs of your neighborhood as well as your house. Did you know that 34% of burglars simply use the front door when breaking into a home? That means if your door is not strong and secure enough, you're basically inviting the burglars in. So setting up security systems is not enough. You need to inspect all your exterior doors, too. Make sure the door frames are strong and the hinges are protected. You can always use door reinforcement kits to add extra protection. If your door has a mail slot, don't forget to check if it's possible for someone to reach through it to unlock the door. When moving into a house or an apartment that was previously occupied by someone else, change the door locks. This is the easiest way to ensure that no stranger can just walk into your house using the keys. One other way to boost security for your door is to use wireless doorbell cameras. This one from Amazon is extremely user-friendly. It's 100% wireless, it has a built-in rechargeable battery that can last 1-2 to two months, so you won't have to charge those too often. You can track the battery situation from the phone app. It also has motion detection technology and super night vision. And you don't need to worry about the weather conditions because it's also waterproof. By the way, don't forget about the sliding glass doors. You can use a window bar or dowel in the track to keep them from being forced open. Or you can add a door sensor or glass break sensor to get alerted if and when someone is tampering with them. We're getting into the very basics of home security now. The percentage of burglars entering a home through a window is as high as 23%. The main reason for that is because most of the time, people forget to lock their windows. Yet again, burglars can always break the glass. If you don't want that to happen, you can try reinforcing the glass with window security film, adding window bars, or installing window sensors. If none of that is possible, you can also plant prickly bushes under the first floor windows to discourage burglars from choosing your house to break in. Now, what's the difference between an actor and a burglar? Burglars don't like to be in the spotlight. <laughs> That's why having outdoor lighting is to your advantage. Lights should be placed around your front and backyards, along pathways, and near the garage. To make your outdoor security lights more effective, you can use motion-activated ones. Take this one for example, it's solar-powered, so it'll help you save energy. But that doesn't mean you won't have any light once the clouds cover the sky. It's able to run 4-5 to five nights on rainy days. Also, don't allow the burglars to play hide-and-seek. While trees and shrubs may make your home look more beautiful, they also provide a convenient hiding spot for burglars. That's why you should trim down trees and plants, at least the ones close to your house that could be used for cover. Choose smaller flowers and bushes instead, so that burglars don't have a hiding spot to wait for you to leave your home. The same thing goes for any lock gates, sheds, or other outdoor buildings you have. Make sure those places are locked. Burglars can use stools and ladders to climb in from the windows, too. So don't tempt them by leaving one outside. Now this one goes without saying, but I will anyway. Lock the garage. Even if there's no access to your home through there, 
it's likely that you still have plenty of valuable stuff stored in there that burglars might be interested in. It's also wise to store your garage door opener inside your house rather than leave it in your car. This way, you'll be preventing burglars from easily taking it. If you use a security code to open your garage, then keep it confidential and avoid entering it in front of other people, including neighbors. Some neighbors, well, you just don't know. Installing a driveway alarm will also help secure the garage. Now These days, not just burglars, but porch pirates, aka package thieves, are a big problem too. Last year, almost 1 in 7 Americans fell victim to them. This is where security cameras proved to be useful. First of all, they work as a deterrent. And secondly, if someone were to really steal your package, you'd be able to identify them thanks to the security footage. If you can't spare some money to get a good security camera for the time being, you can opt for a fake one. They're a lot cheaper, and they will help make your home look more secure than it actually is. This one is worth considering if you're searching the market. It contains a flashing light, which makes it look as realistic as it gets. Now, Last but not least, having a safe wouldn't hurt. And don't worry, it doesn't have to be one of those uncrackable giant titanium ones in the heist movies, like Ocean's 23. Burglars may still be able to break into your house despite all the precautions. So you still need to make sure your valuables are protected at all times. You can hide all things important from your expensive jewelry to your vital documents in there just to be extra safe. If you're going to get yourself one, make sure it is fire-resistant, waterproof, and heavy enough that a thief can't pick it up and walk away with it. As they say, better safe than sorry. On some nights, when the sky over a powerful thunderstorm is clear, you might see elves, gnomes, trolls, or blue jets. Blue jets sound kind of random here, right? But we're not actually talking about fairy tales. These are all just different types of lightning flashes that are mostly visible very high above raging thunderstorm clouds. Let's take red sprites. Those are flashes of light that appear above thunderstorms that come in clusters. They are rare because they're only caused by a specific type of lightning called positive cloud-to-ground strikes. So a positive charge is transferred from a thundercloud to the ground during a lightning strike. These types of lightning make up only 10% of all lightning strikes. For more than half a century, many believed these flashes were just urban legends. People did see them from time to time, but the flashes were so brief that even if you had been lucky enough to catch them, you wouldn't have had time to call someone to witness this phenomenon with you. Even when respectable scientists or pilots would talk about them, the scientific community would mostly ignore them. In 1989, something strange happened. The researchers from the University of Minnesota actually managed to catch sprites on film. And that's how it started. People across the world began sharing videos and photos of red sprites. Red sprites can start as 328-foot balls made of ionized air. These balls shoot down from heights of about 50 miles at 10% of the speed of light. And researchers have been studying not only the lightning that plunges down from ranging clouds, but these colorful flashes that go towards space too. So, electricity stretches up to the electrically charged ionosphere, but at the same time, it crushes down towards the ground. Red sprites come in different shapes, like these big, cool jellyfish sprites that sometimes have areas that measure up to 30 square miles. You may see carrot sprites or column sprites. They're similar, it's just that carrots also have long tendrils. The lower parts of tendrils are often blue, while the higher ones are red. On August 22, 2022, we were able to take some stunning photos of red right streaks in the sky above the Atacama Desert in Chile. They were surrounded by another bigger glow of greenish color. It's something we call air glow, and you can only see it this well when there's no light pollution. It's basically when we use too much artificial light, and among other things, it doesn't allow us to observe stars and other objects we might otherwise see in the sky. 
And this air glow happens because of atoms of nitrogen and oxygen in our atmosphere. Sunlight knocks away their electrons during daytime. Then, they slowly recombine with their electrons, which is a process that causes them to glow. How can you see a red sprite? First, you need to find a large thunderstorm. They're more common during summer and spring, for example, in June. Of course, sprites can appear at any time if there are powerful enough storms with lightning at ground level. The skies need to be clear and very dark, ideally without bright moonlight. And the storm should be around 100 to 200 miles away. That way, clouds won't block the sky and you'll have better visibility. In the perfect scenario, the storm will be moving along a distant horizon, so you'll be able to see everything above the cloud tops. You can track a storm with weather radar. Your eyes need some time to adapt to the darkness around you. Give them some time, about 20 to 30 minutes. Keep your eyes above the clouds and try not to look at the clouds directly. Ignore lightning flashes. A sprite will pop maybe once for every 200 lightning strikes. Don't expect to really capture it on camera, it's not easy. But the view itself will likely be worth the wait. This and similar flashy events are something we call TLEs, which stands for Transient Luminous Events. Blue jets are also worth mentioning. These are dim blue lights that stream up like a very fast puff of smoke above powerful hailstorms. They're also very rare, and in most cases, you'll only be able to see them from an airplane. And now we get to those fairy tale creatures. Elves, when we talk about lightning flashes, are brief disks of dim light you can see about 60 miles high in the atmosphere. It's just an abbreviation. Their full name is Emissions of Light and Very Low Frequency Perturbations Due to Electromagnetic Pulse Sources. Yeah, I suggest we stick to elves. Moving to trolls, those are red spots that pop close to cloud tops after the flash of a very powerful red sprite. Gnomes are the smallest and fastest flashes. We're talking about tiny white spikes of light that flash from the top of a big anvil of thunderclouds. The anvil is that elongated cloud you see at the top of a raging storm. It spreads downwind together with upper level winds and gnomes last for only a microsecond. And check this out. Ball lightning is in the shape of fiery orbs that can be as big as a golf ball or can grow up to a very large beach ball. They can be yellow, red, white, orange, green, or purple. And they can stay alive for a couple of seconds, even minutes sometimes. For the centuries, many people have been talking about how they saw ball lightning sometimes even floating into their homes. But such events are really unpredictable and happen very rarely. Scientists have managed to recreate ball lightning in the lab, or at least something very similar to it. They have realized that ball lightning probably shows up after a lightning bolt strikes the ground. Mineral grains in the soil then vaporize. Here's something spectacular, volcanic lightning. This one is born in the plumes of a wild volcanic eruption. Like the rest of thunderstorms, volcanic lightning forms when static electricity builds up in Earth's atmosphere. And then it gets released in the shape of a lightning bolt. Scientists don't understand the whole mechanism here, but they think it's related to charging. For example, ice charging is what causes thunderstorms to form. It plays a part in producing lightning during volcanic eruptions, too. This happens when the air heated in an eruption rises into the sky and meets cold air. The water from the eruption turns into ice particles, and when these particles bump into each other, some electrons get knocked off. The ice particles that now have more positive charges move higher into the sky and gather together. Or it may be frictional charging, another thing that leads to volcanic lightning. The same as ice charging happens when tiny particles of ice collide. Here we have ash and pieces of rock colliding and creating charged ions. There's dark lightning too. Over 10 years ago, 
researchers discovered that thunderstorms could generate brief but very strong bursts of gamma rays, which is the form of light with the highest energy. They are so bright that they can blind sensors on satellites, even when they're hundreds of miles away. They can also create antimatter. Antimatter is a type of matter made of particles with opposite charges compared to the particles in normal matter. Imagine having two boxes full of blocks. Some blocks are red and some are blue. When these pairs touch each other, they disappear or annihilate and turn into energy. That's what happens when particles of matter and antimatter meet. And these flashes could be the result of dark lightning because it gives off light that's not really visible. Regular lightning involves slow electrons. In dark lightning, electrons are high energy. They crash into air molecules and, by doing that, produce gamma rays. It happens every 43.8 seconds. I'm talking about car theft in the USA. Yep, every minute someone loses their precious vehicle to crooks. If you want to learn more about these heartbreaking stats, here you go. Over 800,000 car thefts were reported in the US in 2020 alone. And Ford pickups win the award for the crook's choice, since it was the one most frequently stolen. Also, New Year's Day had the most thefts. Seems like we all need to keep an eye out for our cars. First things first, it's very unlikely that someone may steal your car while you're on the move. But once you park it, it gets way easier. So you need to park responsibly. Yeah, sometimes you might need to walk a bit more, but it's worth it if it means leaving your car in a well-lit place. Improperly parked cars are often taken away by tow trucks. Turns out, not all of them are real. So, should you ever see one near your car, check whether it's real or fake. A real tow truck should at least have some branding on it, and its crew should be wearing a uniform. Remember I told you it's not that easy to steal your car while you're on the move? Sorry, but that's only partially true. Carjackers don't really care about the fact that you're sitting in your car. The trick here is simple. Even if you're inside your vehicle, always make sure to lock your doors. Carjackers often have shady schemes of how to lure car owners out of their vehicles. They may even set up a trap and sort of stage a car accident. So even if you see that your car has been bumped from behind, don't rush out of it instantly to check on it. Just wait a little bit to pull over. Make sure the place where you stop is safe and there are people around you. In case you get suspicious, it's better to call the police. If you're ready to shell out some money to protect your car, here's some info. You can install a remote car starter. It's not just a great thing for those who live in colder climates and who need to start their car beforehand. Its main advantage is that you can't drive away with a car started like this, since this mode doesn't allow you to shift gears. Any car has a vehicle identification number, or simply VIN. This one may seem pointless, but here's a trick. When thieves sell a stolen car, they do VIN switching. It's when they want to disguise a stolen vehicle and use another VIN from a similar car. But if you etch your VIN on each window of your vehicle, crooks will instantly see that you're interested in protecting your car. Plus, such a vehicle will seem spoiled for them. After all, they'd have to do the VIN switching, plus they'd have to come up with a plan on how to fix the windows as they have the VIN etched on them. They'll probably need to change the windows altogether, and that's pricey. So reselling such a car would appear too time-consuming for crooks, and they aren't willing to put in that much effort. Come on, these guys don't even work. They're way too lazy to deal with those windows. By the way, some specialists can do this etching for you, so you don't have to deal with it yourself. By the way, if you want to buy a used car, a VIN can help you a lot. Some cars are sort of cloned, which means their VIN isn't real, but was simply added to the plate manually. So you have to check all the documentation before buying a used car. Pay special attention to the DVLA V5 documents and make sure that the VIN there coincides with the VIN on the vehicle. Here's another protection gadget. It's called a smart car alarm, and its sound is even nastier than the sound of an alarm clock. It can do two things. First, it makes a super loud sound that can both scare away intruders 
and attract witnesses. Second, it can send you an alert in case you somehow don't hear the deafening sound it makes. There's another secret mechanism that can protect your car. You can install an emergency stop button that you can wire to the ignition, battery, fuel line, you name it. When you get out of the car, you simply need to flip the switch. Even if crooks steal your keys somehow, it won't help them. They need to find the switch to start the car first, and it's up to you where to hide that switch. We all know that the more security you have in your car, the better. Crooks don't like to mess with technologies, and the statistics prove it. Tesla, along with other high-tech cars, were the least stolen ones over the last few years. However, modern doesn't mean safe and crook-proof. Many cool vehicles have engine management diagnostic ports. Sounds super convenient, but there's a downside. These ports can help unlock and even start the vehicle. So if your car has such a feature, consider getting a lockable cover. Always check whether you've closed the windows before leaving your car. Even the smallest gap is enough for a crook to open the door and steal the car. Yeah, don't tell me it's obvious. I somehow see cars with open windows every single day. If a crook really wants to, they can simply smash a window with a heavy object or even a rock. See what I'm driving at? Try not to make crooks want to open your car. That means there shouldn't be any valuables visible. So please, no laptops or purses on the front seat. Hide them in the trunk or take them with you. There are many options. Just don't show thieves that there's something they can steal from your car. Keeping a spare key in the glove box isn't the best idea either. Crooks know where to look for it. It's really simple. They've opened the car, which isn't that complicated, and they just open up the glove box and they're free to drive. So let's say you still keep your valuables in the car and a spare key in the glove box because, you know, you like it that way. Well, consider installing a steering wheel lock. It's probably not that functional, but experts believe it's a working visual deterrent. Remember how thieves are sort of lazy and don't want to mess with various gadgets? Specialists claim that crooks are more likely to pass by a car that has a steering wheel lock on it. So even if a crook still wants to drive your car away, they won't be able to. Plus, it's not that easy to remove it. Now for the most obvious tip, it's CCTV. There's a variety of such cameras today. They have night vision modes, people detection functions, and really high resolution. Literally anything you might need. A real camera can help you watch your car 24 seven. But in case you don't feel like spending money on that, you can install a dummy and hope that the thieves won't figure it out. Okay, let's imagine the worst. Someone ignored all of these simple tips and got their car stolen. What should they do? First, they need to provide all the information to the police. So make sure you know the color. I know, it's easy. But please don't use complicated wording while describing the car color. Like, it's not moss, but rather dark green. You also need to know the year, make, and model. Make sure you remember all these. The police will also need to know your license plate number and VIN. If you don't remember the VIN by heart, write a note on your phone just in case. Did you know that most break-ins take place in the middle of the day? The FBI says burglaries happen midday because people are outside the house. Don't let your home be an easy mark for theft. Here are 10 tips to protect your home and some security items you might need along the way. Number one on our list is portable door locks. They aren't just designed for regular houses. Let's say you stay in a rented house where other guests also come and go. You can carry one of these portable locks with you. Many rooms have secondary locking mechanisms besides the regular lock, like security chains attached to the door, but you shouldn't always rely on them. These mechanisms are only held by screws. It means they're easy to dislocate. There are many portable lock models, so what should you look for? Ease of use is the key for installation and removal in case of emergency. Most inward swing doors are suitable for these items. Adalock is a good example. You can find it on Amazon. 
It's fairly inexpensive, has a versatile design, and most importantly, comes in one piece. It takes seconds to upgrade your safety. You insert the claws into the door strike plate and then close the door. It'll be held in position with a handle. There you go. Burglars don't hang out in your house or bother stealing heavy stuff like TVs. They want to get in and out in under 10 minutes. What you should do is take some precautions to slow them down. Laminated glass is great for this. You should consider investing in it. Normal windows that are made with tempered glass can shatter easily, but laminated windows are like shields. They can crack but not break apart. Instead of making smashing noises and grabbing attention, the burglar will probably leave. The structure of laminated glass is different from the regular one. It holds the piece intact even after a strong impact. Laminated glass windows are 100 times stiffer and 5 times more durable than standard. What makes these types of glass so special? Firstly, it's made with layers. There are two layers of glass and there's a vinyl material in between that helps keep the two layers intact. As a bonus, laminated ones have a soundproofing feature. Two birds with one stone. The interlayer absorbs some of the outside noise. It's glass after all. Aren't we going to see the vinyl layer? That might be the question that popped into your head. Nope, laminated glass is transparent just like other types. Enjoy the crystal clear views while staying safe. I would say, but unfortunately, it's expensive to get these specifically manufactured burglar deterring glasses. You can have professionals install a laminate film onto your standard windows, or you can even buy security film. They all work according to the same principle, but obviously these alternatives cannot be as strong as the laminated glass itself. The next few tips come from an ex-burglar, Michael Fraser. Now he's giving bits of advice on how to protect from theft. His first tip is quite interesting. Don't put a beware of the dog sticker if you have a dog. If a dog can walk around the house without triggering the alarm, so can a human. This is the way burglars think. Plus, many dogs get friendly in a short time unless they're specifically trained to catch strangers. Otherwise, they can easily be put in a room and, well, you know the rest. Bye-bye to precious items. Advertising your house for sale online is a standard procedure to attract potential buyers, but also thieves. With your innocent picks, burglars can have floor plans with virtual tours. They can easily spot the entry and escape routes. Sounds like a perfect plan to rob a house. Number 5 is buying a home security system. It helps prevent thefts and notifies you if that happens. According to the data, homes without a security system are almost three times more vulnerable to break-ins. There are numerous ones to choose from. Some are pricey, but luckily, there are affordable options too. You don't even have to call professionals. This do-it-yourself security system from Amazon is an example of a budget-friendly gadget with useful features. These types of devices are designed to be easy to install. You'll be guided through an app for the software and for the product itself. Bonus, you won't have to deal with screws, tools, or drilling. They have fast emergency dispatch that can notify the authorities if you say so. Since it's easy to set up, it's perfect for short-term residents too. Remember I mentioned that if a dog can walk in the house, so can a thief? Well, technology is not in favor of thieves. These types of devices can now detect intruders and be friends with your pet. The sensors can be put in the window, doors, and corners, but still be adjusted to avoid fake alarms by the pets. Another device to add a layer of protection to you, especially in shared residences like dorms, is a doorstop alarm. These devices are very compact, so you can put them in your luggage and take them on your dream vacation. You can use it in your daily life. A doorstop alarm can be used on any door as long as you place it inside. It works as a door wedge, but it keeps the door closed. How does it work? When the alarm is triggered, it will keep the intruder outside the door and activate a noise alarm. It can wake the owner of the house or neighbors. 
This one, again, can be easily found on Amazon. Ex-Burglar Michael also recommends thinking like a thief. Ask yourself, how would I get in? It's a great starting exercise for discovering vulnerable spots. Walk around your home. Is there a window that can be easily opened? Oh wait, is it your laptop on the desk that can be seen from the street? Speaking of the street, if you buy a new electronic device like a TV or a computer, don't leave the empty cartons displayed near the trash container. This looks like an invitation to thieves. They will know that you have expensive electronics inside the house. Instead, break down the cardboard boxes and then put them away for recycling. Unfortunately, first floor windows are entry points in 23% of home break-ins. To prevent this, you can purchase a wireless alarm kit. When it comes to the front door, installing a double key deadbolt can be a solution. Similarly, motion sensor lighting does the job. Do you have blind spots around your home? Upgrade to a security camera with night vision. If you want to see what's happening inside your house rather than outside, you can get one of these cool security gadgets. Orbi Robotic Mobile Sphere is like a ball, but it has a camera inserted in it. It doesn't have a limited view. Imagine you're at the office and want to play with your dog. Your four-pod best friend can chase the ball at home while you're away controlling the device. Ah, okay, we're here to save your house from burglars, so I'll leave fun pet toys for another video. Here is a shocking truth about fences. Most people believe that fences are like guardians protecting their property. Sorry to break it to you, but even tall and solid ones aren't as secure as you believe. The number one rule of a thief is not to be caught. And if they broke into a house with fences at night, they'd be perfectly covered. Your neighbors can't see who that person is. You know, unless they have x-ray vision. The fences should be hard to climb. One of the points of having a fence is privacy. But I'm just saying metal, wire, and picket fences are harder for intruders to fly in. So, we cracked the burglar's code. Implementing the tips on our list might help you discourage and prevent burglar and keep you safe. Did you experience such unpleasant incidents? If so, do you have any other tips for fellow brightsiders to watch out for? Oops, another burglary in the US has just occurred. Wait another 22.6 seconds and there will be another one. Hey, no need to worry about your property. Forewarned, forearmed. Let's explore a few tips on how to protect your house. A mere sticker can contribute a lot to your house's safety. For instance, you can use a sticker that says you have a home security system, even if in reality you don't. It may not sound convincing enough, but still, burglars prefer not to mess with such houses. Just one more tip here, make sure the sticker looks true to life, so a makeshift sign won't do. It's better to fork out some money and grab a real looking sticker. Another smart trick is to leave a pair of really large shoes on the porch so that the burglars could clearly see them. It will make them think someone big and dangerous lives there and they won't fancy meeting them. Right, now let's inspect your door. I hope you don't leave the keys under the doormat. The only things you can leave under the mat are the cookies or chips. This is a fun way to see if someone was visiting you while you were away. However, the trick doesn't give you a 100% guarantee. It might be a mailman, a delivery guy who got the wrong door, or even a random dog hanging around your porch. Yeah, cookies feel better in your stomach, not under the doormat. Okay, you're back home from work. It was a tough day and you're tired. You leave the keys in the keyhole and completely forget about it. Right, the main thing is that you've locked the door and the keys are inside. But who said there is no burglar in the bushes targeting your house? Technically, it might be impossible to insert a dupe and get in if there's a key in the keyhole. But these guys are well equipped and have a whole assortment of hooks to lure the key out. You know what happens next? They can seep into your house as silently as ninjas and grab all your valuables while you're peacefully sleeping. A lock that can only be closed from the inside and can't be opened from the outside seems like a good solution. When moving to a new place, even if you didn't buy it but rent it, make sure to change the locks. Who knows how many copies of those keys there are? 
As for renting, you never know who lived there before you moved in. Also, if for some reason you accidentally left your keys in the front door for some time, the best thing to do is to change the lock. Yeah, probably nothing bad will happen, but still, it's better to play it safe. Plus, not only should you stop leaving the keys in the door, but you also shouldn't leave them on display. Maybe it's better to bring the keys to the living room instead of keeping them near the front door. Sometimes, burglars can use not only your door, but your window too. Mind your trash, especially if you throw away some pricey stuff packaging. Don't let the thieves know what you purchased and how much you paid for it. Also, your trash may contain some essential information about your personal data, credit card details, and so much more. Keep an eye on your mailbox. Make sure you have a lock on it. Thing is, burglars may be quite interested in your mail contents, so the secret is simple. Keep the mailbox locked and make sure you shred any personal data related papers. Now let's inspect your front lawn. Hey, I can see something compromising. I'm talking about these large bushes. Yeah, I know you don't have time to trim them. The larger they get, the more space there is for the burglars to hide. Plus, if someone sees untrimmed shrubs and trees in the front yard, they might think nobody's home. You see the point, right? Okay, let's say you ignored all the previous tips and burglars broke into your house. The most interesting thing for them is surely cash. If you don't have any cash at home, you can skip this tip. But if you have valuables, get creative. Cash can be stuffed into a plastic bag and hidden in a large container with some leftovers. Also, you can place that plastic bag into an old detergent bottle you keep in the storeroom or the kitchen. Burglars aren't likely to look for your stash there. A couple of don'ts here. Hiding cash or jewels in a prescription pills container isn't that smart. And yeah, a freezer isn't the best option either. Many burglars like to check it in the first place. Time to see if you keep your keys right. If you keep your car and house keys together, you might want to reconsider it. First off, imagine you lose them and burglars somehow know where you live. Not only will they grab what they want, but they'll also have a vehicle to transport all your hard-earned belongings. Keep an eye on your garage keys, especially if it's possible to sneak into your house through your garage. Even if it isn't, who said there are no valuables in the garage? However, there are no limits whatsoever for burglars. They can sneak into houses even through small windows. The reason why they prefer doors is that it's the safest way. While squeezing through the window can get scratches, and it's not that they don't want to spoil their looks. The thing is, if they leave their DNA, they can be traced. However, crooks are careful about not leaving their traces. For instance, a report from England claims only about 3% of burglars leave forensic evidence. To protect yourself at night, there are several options. Number one, insert a large paper clip or a bobby pin inside the keyhole. You can use a spare pair of keys if you have them. This way, you'll make it extremely hard, if not impossible, for the burglars to use the key dupes. Number two, barricading is an option. It can be a heavy chair, a bookshelf, you name it. I mean, why not if it makes you feel safe? If your door opens outwardly, a jammer could do a great job for you. A chair can be super handy. Secure it under the doorknob. It's not the most powerful security system, but at least it does its job. Binding the doorknobs or handles together can be an option too. A dummy security camera can protect you during the day and night. Again, burglars are not as fearless as they may seem. If you have a real CCTV, make sure the crooks don't deactivate it. So place it in some hard to get place. If you're ready to fork out some money for protection, then the motion sensor light is exactly what you need. Crooks like dim spots, and once they approach your place, they'll be frightened off by the bright light. This solution works as long as the burglars know you're home. In case they're sure you're away, it's way less efficient. TV and radio timers are another trick. With their help, you can imitate your home even if you're not. 
a perfect match for the motion sensor light. This trick can help outsmart some burglars, but again, it doesn't give a 100% guarantee. Some of them aren't afraid to break in, even if the TV's on. What about live alarm systems? This can be real or fake too. I'm talking about dogs. Remember the trick with the boots? You can do the same with a dog if you don't have one. Leave a large bowl on the porch, but make sure it all looks real. I mean, the bowl should not look untouched and brand new. Hey, do you know all your neighbors? If not, it's high time you baked some cookies and visited them to know them better. First, the crooks don't really like to operate in areas where few people know each other and care for each other. This way, their chances of being spotted and reported are extremely high. So, a sort of neighborhood watch is a perfect way to protect your house. And who knows? Find new friends. Burglaries are on the rise in your neighborhood, and you have concerns about whether your house might be vulnerable. You have no surveillance system, so tonight, you're placing some foil over the front door handle before you go to bed. This will help identify if someone sneakily tries to enter while you sleep. You wake up the next morning, and it appears the foil is slightly ripped. Someone has been here, and they're sure to return. Another option is to put a mug on the doorknob. When the knob turns, the mug will fall, causing a noise to wake you up and hopefully deter the intruder. Your main concern is that a tradesman stopped by recently. He said that he was working next door and asked to use your toilet. You refused and felt bad at the time for being rude. But it was a very smart move. About 60% of burglaries in the USA are made by someone you know or have met before. That tradesman, while going to the bathroom, could have adjusted something in your house to make their return entry a little easier. They may have wanted to take a closer look at what security system is installed, check the structural integrity of your home, and found out what valuable loot you might have. Finally, today you're going on vacation. You need to prepare your house and make it as safe as possible. A full post box is the first thing a robber will look for in a target. Your neighbor will need to take your mail while you're away. A well-manicured property is a clear sign that you are always there. You've always kept your lawn mown and hedges trimmed, so you will need to arrange for someone to do this while you're away. If it was winter, any untouched snow around your house would also make it a target. Having a neighbor make pretend footprints that show recent activity will also provide a deterrent. There are many types of hedges that act as a great first defense. Luckily, you have sharp-leaved shrubs along your fences. If someone jumps into your property and lands on a sharp or spiky bush, they will immediately cry out in discomfort. This will alert your neighbors of an intruder. And the foliage will also catch fragments of clothing that could be used as evidence later. In preparation for your trip the week before, you opened and closed your curtains at random times throughout the day. You made sure there were no clear patterns, so it won't matter if they're left open while you're away, just in case someone was scouting your property. Burglars spend several days walking or driving through neighborhoods, identifying the behaviors of each house. One thing they don't really like is a neighborhood watch. Criminals do their research before they start scouting and will avoid these areas. Something for you to organize when you get back. Now, move all your expensive electronics away from the windows so there's nothing of value in clear view. Put them inside a cupboard or a concealed room. Don't worry about TVs. They're too large and take effort to move. The criminals are more interested in the smaller devices, like an iPad and gaming devices. Put your small expensive items, like jewelry, in boxes and hide them away in a secret location. Surprisingly, a kid's room is a good spot. Burglars have admitted to never going into them, as there's nothing of value in toys. Take photos of all the serial numbers on your electronic devices and create an inventory for insurance purposes. 
95% of break-ins are done by force, so it's time to reinforce your windows and doors. You can make it even more difficult for the crooks. Remove all stools, chairs, and ladders in the backyard and put them into your garage. Otherwise, they will help provide easier access points to higher entrances, like the air conditioner box. This is one of their favorites. Without a way to reinforce it, it's easy to tear off and creates an entrance. Don't make it easier for them with a step up. Burglars can break down a weak door within one minute. Install a metal frame instead of wood for more support. The hinges and lock should have adequate strength to withstand being kicked long enough until they give up. With the lock as the remaining weak spot, this can easily be picked by an experienced thief. A simple protection lock that holds it in place will make sure it won't budge. The hinges on your garage door swing outwards, which makes it vulnerable and can be accessed by taking the pins out of the hinges. Replace them with tamper-proof pins so they can't be removed. And lastly, the garage overhead door is one of the first places a burglar looks to access. They don't have a lock that fully secures them. Attach a padlock on the latch connecting it to the track, holding it in place. Your garage door doesn't have this option, so drill a hole in the track just above one of the rollers and attach a padlock. Robbers are scared of dogs, the territorial and loyal guardians of the house. A survey found that most houses burgled didn't have dogs because thieves don't want to draw attention during a heist. Unfortunately, you don't own one, but just placing a dog bowl outside the front door will discourage them. The burglars have adapted their craft with technology. Four out of five criminals use social media like Facebook, Twitter, and Google Maps to find their targets. Even sharing a photo with a house key in it is enough for a burglar to create their own key by zooming in and taking the exact measurements. Make sure your wireless network is secure and use a new, much stronger password while away. You're not only vulnerable to physical objects being stolen, valuable data like passwords and access codes can be taken through your network. And there's also the threat of infecting devices through malicious malware. You can also remove the vision of your house completely from Google Maps. Type in your home address, find the street view of your residence, press the options button and select report a problem. You'll be taken to a screen with an image of your home with the option to move a red square to cover your property. Request it to be blurred under the option My Home and enter your exact address. It will only take a couple of days to be processed. Don't leave the radio on while away. It won't help. Through the burglar's method of scouting houses, they take note of radio and TV sounds. When they return, they check if they're still on, which just makes it easier to confirm that no one's home. An alternative option to show active presence at home is by making your own audio, something that plays ambient noises randomly throughout the day, with footsteps, conversations, and a dog barking. Leaving your lights on is also not a good idea. Someone spying will notice your house easier, especially at night, and you'll be further robbed on your electricity bill. You're just about ready to leave on your vacation and need to take the trash out. If you have some large boxes, break them down so they can fit inside the bin. Hide any clues about what valuables you recently received. Last check, all the doors are locked and no windows are left open. Now you can finally enjoy your trip. But as you enjoy yourself in your picturesque location, leave any snaps on your phone while you're over there and post them online only when you return. If you do share your photos while you're away, it will have made all your preparations pointless. Every criminal in the area will know you're not home. But with 2.5 million houses burgled annually in the USA, 
a house without a modern security system is 300% more likely to be broken into. When you get back from your break, it will be a great idea to install one. Hey, look, it's your friend George, and he has a dog you've never seen with him. That's because it's his sister's new pup, and it's so cute, too. You desperately want to pet it. But instead of just getting down to it, here's a few things to consider. First, turn to your friend and ask if it's okay to pet the dog. For all you know, this dog in particular might not like to be petted. It might be afraid of strangers, or even a bit skittish around them. Who knows? It might just be having a bad hair day. Maybe the mail carrier didn't bring in a cookie this time around while delivering the mail. Looking at the dog, you can start to approach it carefully. Or better yet, you can let the dog approach you instead. See how it reacts. Definitely don't rush with open arms if you're coming in for a hug. Don't make any sudden moves and don't look fearful, or it might give a signal for the little guy to go into a defensive stance and curl up. You don't want that. The end goal here is to make it be your friend, right? If you really want to be sure it's willing to engage with you, ignore it. Okay, that sounds counterproductive. But picture this. You're out talking to your friend, pretending the pup doesn't even exist. It starts getting interested in you because you're a new person and now you've got its attention. The rest is easy. Still, if you do decide to approach it, let it take the final steps. Oh, and don't look it directly in the eye. Get this, you know how polite it is to look someone in the eye while you're talking to them? It can even be considered common courtesy. Well, in the pooch world, it means the opposite. They might not like you too much if you look them in the eye. In fact, I'm fairly sure they might think you're rude instead. Okay, you've successfully approached the dog you really want to pet. Now, you let it sniff you. Relax your posture, but slowly, as you don't want to startle your new friend. You can extend your hand now, but still slowly. Do it with your palm facing down and your fingers slightly curled under for safety reasons. A little nip can still hurt. Let the dog get comfortable with you. If you notice that it's sniffing your hand for a long while, let it. Dogs need to get comfortable with strangers too. If it gets too excited though, it might become the one invading your private space instead by jumping around and licking you. Don't fret though, just remain calm. If you start getting uncomfortable, you can get yourself out of the situation by turning away with your arms folded. Like this, you'll become boring to the dog and it'll start losing interest in you. The owner can then have a chance to calm it down or even take it away. If you're speaking to the dog, be sure to use English, as this is the most common language for dogs. Actually, I made that up. Rather, just make sure to use a calm and reassuring tone. Here's the part you've been waiting for. You can go ahead and pet it. Now, don't jump it and start hugging it, though. Keep the pace you've had with it so far. Don't pet it on its head. Your hand won't be in their field of vision if you do this. And you've got to admit, a hand coming out of nowhere would freak out just about anyone. You can start by stroking the dog's ears and neck. They also enjoy rubs on their back and shoulders. While petting the dog, keep paying attention to its body language. Because if their body is slightly curved, they're wagging their tail and circling you with excitement. It's a good sign, and it means they want to get to know you. One thing we love about dogs when they're playing is extending their legs on the floor while bowing down. If they do this, you're in. They want to play. But be on the watch for behavior that indicates they're not enjoying your company all that much. If they're showing you their teeth or growling at you, that's a sign to back off. A stiff standing tail can also mean they're feeling threatened. There's another way dogs can show they're stressed and anxious too by licking their lips or even yawning. During your interaction, always respect the dog and keep in mind they have their own boundaries too. You go back home and your own dog, Riley, is waiting for you at your doorstep. Excited as ever, he licks your face and jumps around you. His best friend is home. To make your dog love you even more, get down to its level once in a while and lie on the floor with your best bud. When you do this, give it loads of kisses and affection. They love it and will be sure to give back twice as much. Now, you might get a bit of drool on your face, but it's for a good reason. I mean, come on, just look how happy it is looking at you. It's important to keep them happy. And one thing we can do is grab a tennis ball and play fetch with them. 
It doesn't need to be a tennis ball, though. A plastic water bottle would probably work as well. Say you're out in the woods walking with your buddy and he brings you a huge stick. His tail is wagging so you know he's proud of his achievement. If he's trying to give you the stick, chances are he wants to play fetch. So, grab that stick and throw it far. Your dog will be back with it faster than you can count to 10. Wait, is that two sticks he has now? More fun, I guess. Down these woods, there's a little lake. Some dogs absolutely love water. If yours is like mine, chances are at the beach or next to a lake, it's going to spend more time in the water than sitting next to you. Before this, though, make sure your dog can swim. Jump in the water with it and see how well it does. If it can't swim, there's still a way for it to enjoy being out in the water. It's called a doggy life vest. Just be sure to strap it tight before you both take a dip. Remember those days when you would spend the entire afternoon playing hide-and-seek with your friends? Well, guess what? You can do that with your dog, too! Their noses are great, and they love showing off how good their sense of smell is. You probably noticed how they spend their time during walks, half looking at the scenery and half smelling things. Pick a good hiding spot in your house and call your dog. It'll come and find you. Chances are it's going to be confused at first, but once it gets into the game, you're both going to have a good time. It's important to make sure your dog is social, too. Set up playdates whenever you can, especially when they're puppies, so they learn other dogs are okay. Hanging out with your friends is an important part of your social life, and it's the same for your dog. They get really excited when they meet someone new, and if they have a whole afternoon to get to know them, they're bound to have a happy day. Throw a whole puppy party if you want. Lots of dogs hanging out together, and even more things to share and talk about. At the end of the day, before you both hit the sack, both of you can enjoy a bit of quiet time together. My dog is a lap dog. Any chance he gets, he lies on my lap, even if there's already a computer on it. He doesn't seem to understand what paying the bills mean. But I can't say no to his cute little nose, so sometimes I put work aside for a few minutes and give him the very deserved tummy rubs he deserves. There's a whole bunch of other things you can do, like teaching your dog a new trick. It doesn't matter what age it is, what matters is how much it loves learning. If it doesn't know how to roll over, grab a sack of treats and get to work. It'll appreciate it as much as you, and it might even be something neat to show your friends when they come over. Good dog, Riley. Oh, you're such a good boy. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on this.